All right, we've had some overviews. Now let's talk about managing the audit. You don't just charge in there and start auditing this and that. You actually have someone managing this. And whoever is managing this is not only doing project management, but they're also make, making sure that the audit is doing what it's supposed to be doing, that it is a, achieving the objectives laid out for us, that we have sufficient auditors and resources that we can actually do this audit effectively, and that whoever is doing this or that part of the audit, that they're actually competent for that particular part of the audit. So the audit manager has got to make sure that this whole thing is achieved the way it should be and that we are using our people and our resources effectively and properly. One of the first things you need to have is some kind of authority for having this audit. And so the organization that brings in the auditor, the business that is being audited, is going to have an audit committee. Now the audit committee is generally going to be comprised of people who are not working for the business day to day. They'll be like boards of directors and, and those kinds of folks, or super senior management. But you have to be careful that the audit committee has its own level of independence, that they are genuinely interested and not trying to hide something. And so that's why we have uh, additional stakeholders and board of directors and, and little more outside people who are not directly um, involved in whatever the activities are. The audit committee has responsibilities. They are there to help on a high level manage risk and make sure that um, all of the financial reporting and processing is done appropriately. They're there to actually hire us as the auditors. They monitor the control functions, in other words, the things that are used to mitigate risk, be they procedures or technologies or processes. They manage the guidelines. They ensure that the audit job, the audit function itself, supports the objectives. And um, they develop the audit charter, which we're going to talk about in just a second. And they review the audit activities. And they also um, review the audit charter. If they're going to hire you as an auditor or an auditing firm, they're going to create this letter of engagement, this engagement letter. And the, the engagement letter basically says, hey, um, we need you guys to do an audit within this sort of area. So if we take a look at this sample here, you should know that an engagement letter is basically going to state very clearly what it is that the third party who's doing the auditor, what it is that they're going to do, and the, the scope and the target areas. So we can see the objective is we're going to plan an evaluation of da-da-da-da-da, so here's the objective. The scope will be for these systems or for this period of time. The um, contact information, there's always contact information in the engagement letter. There's always target areas. What are we actually targeting when we audit? Because you don't like audit the whole company. You, you, you target something specific. Or you target like a specific sort of area or process. And then um, in accordance with whatever requirements, standards, laws, um, whatever governance is there. And then here are the team members and here is the time frame. So this is the engagement letter that uh, we expect the audit committee to come up with when they engage us to do the auditing. Now the charter, here's another thing that they're required to be responsible for. Why are we even doing this audit? Well, there's a mission here, to ensure operations are conducted in accordance with higher standards. Who is responsible? OK, the internal audit is the responsibility of the CFO or the CIO or, or whoever it is, probably the CFO, but it could also be the CIO as well the chief financial officer, the chief information officer. And then the roles. Um, so the audit role, the internal audit, will coordinate with the external audit. The scope is to review our risk management procedures, or whatever it is. You have to clearly state what it is we're auditing. We're not just like looking through dumpsters or something. We're, we're, lo we're looking for something very specific in a specific scope, a, a specific area. And then who's responsible? So the audit is responsible for planning and conducting and reporting and following up. So the charter will state all of these things very clearly. Now, um, common auditing practices. It's very, very common to not only audit using internal people, but also to engage an external third party like PricewaterhouseCoopers um, or you as the, uh, uh, as the CISA team. And so very common to engage 
external folks, which is why we saw the uh, letter of engagement. Very common to use computer-aided auditing tools or auditing techniques, and very common to do, like I'd said before, risk-based auditing. That's really the focus these days, to do risk-based auditing. So that we understand risk. The whole thing is, like, you could be going on forever, so why don't we get to the point? What, it is, what is it that we're trying to protect? When you do risk-based auditing, the first thing you do is you identify, what are we protecting? Well, we're protecting our data, we're protecting our servers, we're protecting our documentation, we're protecting our people, we're protecting our processes, we're protecting our intellectual property. You need to uh, make sure that management determines what is it that's important to them. What do they have to have to make their business run? And it's not just going to be the database. It's also going to be people and processes and, and documentation, and it's going to be um, their data, and it's going to be their servers and their infrastructure. You get them to determine for this audit what is it that we are protecting. Now that we have written down what is it that we're protecting, and, and it's, they should get a group of people together. They should have the, uh, a committee put together to figure this out. And it shouldn't just be IT people. It should be also managers and IT and all kinds of stakeholders, including um, mid and lower level managers who really know what it is they need to do their business day to day. So we list what are the things we're protecting. And senior management can prioritize, of course, what's the most important. Then after that, once we know what it is we're protecting, then what are the known threats? And what are the known risks? Okay. And this is where you get a bunch of people together and you think outside the box. I mean, and, and you're going to spend a couple days on this. What are the risks? Or can you imagine risks? I mean, maybe 20 years ago we never imagined a risk of someone deliberately flying an airplane into a building, right? But um, you try to imagine what are all the risks. Well, there are known ones. We get viruses, we get hackers, we get people stealing stuff, we have employee th fraud and theft, we have um, the cleaning crew stealing things, we have um, accidental information exposure because a salesperson accidentally clicks reply all when it should have been selective. Um, and, and some of these are honest risks and, and honest mistakes, and some of them are malicious, and some of them are environmental. Well, we're in an earthquake zone, we're in a flood zone, we're in a hurricane zone, we're in a this, we're in a that. Um, we're at risk because of, well, maybe our whole financial district will get flooded because of some hurricane. Uh, maybe um, uh, we're close to an airport, and so there can be um, incidents at the airport that cause uh, things. Uh, so you get people to just totally think outside the box, list every possible risk. Don't bother prioritizing anything. Just brain bust it out. Just what are, everybody, think of any possible, no matter how crazy, what's the risk? Well, there's a risk of uh, solar flares shutting down satellites, which cut our communications. I mean, think of everything, okay? Then what you do, you have a list of everything you're trying to protect, every possible imaginable risk to those things, and then you start prioritizing. Okay, what are the things that are the most important that we've got to be looking at? And you assign, and there are two ways of approaching this, you either assign a level of probability and impact, or you assign a dollar value. And you can go either way. Sometimes you can't quantify with dollar value, so instead you say, well, on a scale of 1 to 10, the probability that this will happen, a virus infection, is 9, and the impact is 2. And so therefore, 9 times 2 on a scale of 100, this is a risk of 18. Uh, and and you, you, you give this. Or you say, you know, if we have a virus, um, uh, uh, some kind of virus attack, it takes us half a day to clean and we lose X number of dollars. So you, you either qualify or quantify the value of the risk. And that helps you prioritize what is the most important to focus your time and effort on. At some point, you draw a line and you say, okay, these risks um, are worth it. The rest of them are so unlikely, they'll just fall below the threshold. We'll call that residual risk, and we'll just have sort of like a, a general blanket plan for things that are highly unlikely to happen or things we, that are so far out of our control that um, we, we can't protect against that. Uh, like we can't protect against solar flares. But what we can do is we can have a contingency. So whenever you have that residual risk, 
you just have a contingency and it can be like, well, either we back up and restore um, or we work somewhere else or how do we just keep our, our business going? And we'll talk about those contingencies when we talk about business continuity and disaster recovery. But anyway, you've, you've identified what you're protecting. You've identified um, all of the potential risks. You've either assigned a dollar value to the risk based on what you know or what would happen. If something, if, we, if the server was stolen, that's $30,000 plus X amount of software plus man hours plus, and, and don't be afraid, and you should include soft cost as well as hard cost. So like what, what are the man hours to, to get this thing functioning again? If you can't quantify it with dollars, then you do like a, um, a probability and an impact on a scale of 10. Probability, five on a scale of 10, 10 being the highest, one being the lowest. Impact, five. So therefore, on a scale of 100, this risk is worth 25. And, and you, you lay it all out so you know what should be your highest priority, what, what should you be targeting. And so when we talk about risk, we're talking about these threats could be anything, improper access, former employees, data theft, but it could be all kinds of stuff, environmental, lightning strikes, dust. Like um, when I worked in Africa, extremely high risk was the, um, the dust. I mean, we, dust got into everything, and, and the dust also had such a high iron content that we actually would have rust forming on circuit boards and destroying circuit boards. That was a risk that existed in that uh, location couldn't get around it because there was no way to keep it out. We couldn't, in those facilities, maintain a clean room environment. So our mitigation was don't buy super expensive stuff and realize we have to, uh, we have to replace it maybe every two, three years. And that, that was our risk mitigation. So you, you identify what you're protecting. You identify all of the imaginable risks. You qualify or quanti quantify the cost or the value of the risk, and at some point you have a cutoff line, and everything below that is residual. You either you can't do anything about it, so therefore, what's your contingency? And that is risk-based approach to auditing. Now, now that we've identified the risks, the next thing we need to do is see are there controls in place to mitigate the risk, and are those controls being implemented? properly. So the next thing we'll talk about is controls.